Welcome to Pitch It, the fintech startups podcast. One founder, one startup, one investor at a time. I'm your host, Todd Anderson, Chief Content Officer, Fintech Nexus. In episode 61, I talk with Stephanie Sample, founder and CEO of Funded. Funded is driven by a mission to empower business owners on their growth journeys by simplifying business finance and access to capital. You know, and I have to say this might be my favorite episode thus far. Stephanie was incredibly candid, incredibly engaging, and she is as passionate a founder as I've come across in doing these episodes. The smallest of the small businesses have obviously never been served by banks. And as Stephanie points out in the episode, they really haven't been served by fintechs either. Most of these companies have fewer than 10 employees, and many have either one, two, or three. Stephanie and I talked about some of the main barriers these small business owners face when looking to raise capital, why it's a myth that you cannot serve these companies, how her marketing background played a crucial role, raising capital, and much, much more. Without further ado, I present Stephanie Sample, founder and CEO of Funded. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Stephanie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So, you know, I'd like to start the episode just with some background. So if you can tell uh, me and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and um, you know, a little bit about your career before starting Funded. Awesome. Yeah, sure. So Stephanie Sample, I am in Missoula, Montana, um, pretty much the place all great fintechs are born. Um, <laughs> the list is so long that I might be the only one on it, um, but it's a great place to, to be. And I've been here since college where um, when I graduated, I immediately became a small business owner. So my background's always been in business ownership since college. I've been super fortunate to be an entrepreneur. Um, it, it really is like the result of being in Montana. Like when, when you graduate from college in Montana in 08 of all times, um, entrepreneurship seemed <laughs> a lot more appealing than the non-jobs that existed. So I didn't yep. know that this was my path, but this is kind of where I ended up and where I've always been. I have to ask what brought you to go to Montana in the first place for school. And obviously something was great enough there to, to keep you in Montana. And obviously you still live there today. Yeah, actually. So um, I, I like to call this out to all the San Franciscans that live in Montana now. Um, I am actually a Montana native, um, also in Salt Lake too, but we are like an original Montana ranch family. Um, wow. Whole history of it. And so when I ended up at University of Montana in Missoula for college, um, I didn't actually know if I was going to stay or not. Um, but ended up uh, being kind of in business ownership and locked into Montana before I even graduated from college. So the whole business ownership path is what kept me here. And um, I feel pretty lucky about that. It's a really awesome place to be. Had you ever thought of, you know, obviously you, you, you mentioned you left, um, you finished school 08. Um, you know, you started a, a business before that, had you ever thought I'm going to be an entrepreneur? This is something I potentially want to do, or is it, like you said, it just kind of fell into place because there wasn't a lot of other jobs and it was kind of a bad economic time. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I was like a very normal college student, maybe not normal in the like FinTech world. They seem to all go to like really <laughs> nice schools and we're super smart. I was like more just having good time and having fun and figuring it out. I mean, I worked hard. I was the first person in my family to go and graduate from college. So I took it seriously, but honestly, like I was just pretty proud of myself for going to college at all and thought I would figure it out. Um, I actually thought that I would get a job in international business. I had gone to school in China. I was a Chinese minor. I really wanted to go back. Um, and then 08 happened. 
So um, I was looking for a job, actually. I would have loved to have been employed and just had a good job, but they were, it was such an awful market. Like it, it was really discouraging. Yeah. And at the same time, I was like making these bags on the side out of my marathon kind of race gear. And so I was meeting with a professor and like, probably in tears, like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And <laughs> they have this bag. Do you think I should try to sell it? Um, and he is the person that really encouraged me to, you know, take a risk and bet on myself instead of look for a job. So what brought you to the idea of funded? Um, and, you know, why the name funded? Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about the company overall. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the idea of funded came. Um, so like I said, I've been a business owner for the last 15 years. Um, in a unique situation, my husband and I are partners, and we own an entire portfolio of small businesses, so not just one. And I had just exited one of the brands that I owned, um, sold them to one of the bigger owners of a franchise brand that I was in. I had some new time on my hands. This is like right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I also kind of had a chip on my shoulder about women entrepreneurship. I had like recently had a bad experience um, as a female business owner. And then if you can remember back in the pandemic, when the first round of PPP loans came out, there was this article in the Wall Street Journal that was essentially like, as predicted, a bunch of white male bankers gave out all of the PPP to a bunch of middle-aged white dude business owners. And I was like pissed. I was like, yep. it was just like, ah, oh, I I am not gonna be on the sidelines. No one's fixing this. Like this just pisses me off. And and it just so it was like timing was right that I was in a place looking for like what should I do next. I knew I wanted to spend my time solving for small business owners, specifically women at the time. Um, so the origin story definitely was. Um, I knew whatever I was going to do next was going to have a really big impact on women business owners, but I also knew I didn't want to segment by gender because I think that that further kind of marginalizes women. So I just knew I wanted to create something that was going to have a really big impact on these entrepreneurs. And I went into it with a really open mind. I've been lucky to have a great network um, that teaches me. And so I kind of put it out to the universe and said, I want to solve for this group. I don't know how. Um, and I just want to learn. And I got so many people meeting with me, teaching me like people from like people that start banks to people in fintech to even like educational angles. And I really landed on if I wanted to have the biggest impact on this segment, I needed to get into the way the businesses are financed because the biggest problem that just kept popping up was this idea that um, our system is broken and outdated, and um, there's not a lot of incentive for the specifically the banking systems to solve it. Yep. Um, and so it was going to take someone that just really wanted to solve this problem um, because it was going to be hard. It was going to be low margin, um, and it was going to be a grind. And and I was like, great, I'm looking for a big challenge, and just kind of went down that rabbit hole. And eventually, and things actually happened very fast for me, like funded only started last May, um, where it was like, okay, we're getting into finance. Um, it looks like technology is the best way to do this at scale because it's a low margin kind of business model. We have to do it at scale. So it, tech has to be involved, which is when I learned the term fintech, which I was like, what the hell is this? You know, like, <laughs> um, and arrived on it needing to be venture backed. Another thing that I never really wanted to do. Like, I mean, if you think about it, I just spent 15 years as a, like, me and my husband being the sole owners of businesses. I'm like, really don't want to report to anyone, um, but it was the right way to help this audience. Um, but the, the, I think the most interesting thing about starting Funded that was unique for me was I have a strong background in marketing and I wanted to de-risk what I was going to spend the next 10 years of my life doing more than I wanted to de-risk it for the investors. I wanted to de-risk it for myself. Mm -hmm. And I learned early that um, customer acquisition costs was a big barrier in FinTech on getting those numbers right and the yep. business model. 
So the first thing I did actually was build something to see if I could beat the market at acquiring small business owners. Um, and I did that successfully before I raised my seed round and essentially raised my seed round on that. But on the name, um, I'm a marketer at heart. Um, the name is solely a Saturday morning looking at a trademark site and a website domain <laughs> site coming up with anything. I could like care less what the name was going to be. I just need I, I need a good domain and something I could trademark. And um, so I was like spelling every word on earth wrong, like coming up with all sorts of stupid <laughs> stuff. And then like I typed in funded and it worked and I checked the domain and I was like done. And it was just like, um, you know, drinking coffee at the wee hours in the morning. My husband walked up and I'm like, oh, thank God I have a name. Cause it was like <laughs> the worst, right? Like everyone that's ever named anything. It's the worst thing ever. The strangest story I've heard is um, a company uh, took out a Latin dictionary and started going through a Latin dictionary and they ended up with a name. I forget exactly the, the name. I'd have to look back in my notes, but um, yeah, naming companies is not easy. No, it's awful. So I'm just so glad. I was like, never again. Thank God we're done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, back to your PPP point, we wouldn't uh, be around without PPP. And I remember the first round was excruciating um, yeah. to get that done. We got it. Uh, and we actually got the second round as well. But um, yeah, there was a whole host of, of issues with that program. Yeah. And it's I still see. working its way through Congress. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. So it's, still, it's still a little scary for business owners. Like yeah. there's so many unknowns. It was like we had, so we had to apply for multiple businesses in our portfolio. Um, oh, yeah. And so honestly, we ended I would say FinTech with, did well with it once yeah. they got to their hands on it. Yeah. I think without FinTech, it, it would have been brutal because the banks, you know, what do what the banks usually do, which is they, come back inside. They kept to their own customers. They didn't serve anyone outside their network, even though Congress said, you know, we need this money out fast to as many businesses as possible. And without the likes of, you know, fintech and maybe some of the more fintech friendly banks who helped actually fund the loans and, and originate them, then we wouldn't have gotten um, anywhere right. near uh, the success that the, the program was. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the margins, um, and uh, using technology to scale that. Obviously, banks have always said the smallest of the small are not economically feasible for them to serve, which is why wow. they focus on the big corporates. Uh, but more recently, I thought it's interesting to, to bring up for this conversation was Brex, which made yes. its name on helping small businesses first, said that now we're no longer helping the smallest of the small. We're going to help the companies that are a bit bigger in size because the margins on the smaller companies are not good enough. So, you know, what made it special to, or, or part of the mission to serve the smallest of the small companies and then kind of what's the response to the margin question when the likes of Brex and, and even the big banks kind of ignore or exit this market because of those small margins. Right. Well, let me go ahead and pick a fight with Brex because that's what they need is some like nobody that nobody cares about calling them out for their bullshit. Right. Um, Brex did not start solving small businesses. Brex was a VR company that could give a shit about small businesses, but wanted to make it as a VR company and Y Combinator and their company wasn't working. And so they you know, started this card company saying like, oh, we can't believe we can't get a card. Um, we have all this funding. Um, and then if you really look at Brex's history, they've always underwritten based on cash flow and like multiples of cash flow with a minimum cash flow requirement of $50,000 in your bank account, which every small business owner listening to this is laughing at right yeah. now, because that's not a thing. And then two years ago, they started doing venture debt. So the, the argument that's out there right now that Brex um, less small business because it's not economical and stuff, I would argue that Brex never really wanted to serve small businesses. They got almost all of their early customers through their Y Combinator connections based. They have a whole team underwriting based on term sheets. And, and it's really annoying to me, right? Because they're putting this like 
bad name on serving small businesses, which we need so many companies right now looking for ways to serve small businesses. So the impact of their super dumb tech crunch release is very annoying to me, as you can tell, <laughs> um, because these businesses are totally servable. They're literally the backbone of our country. Yeah. They employ way more people than any tech company or big corporate does. And, and um, they're, they're like the hardworking people, right? Like we're talking about owner operators. You're not finding someone that's like running a downtown brick and mortar store, spending their entire week at a golf course and buying like multi-million dollar homes. Like these are like the people we're all surrounded by and they just have a lot of barriers. And, and so, like I said, like it, it needs to be done at scale. It's a volume game, which I know well, it's the kind of businesses I've always been in. Um, and it needs people in a lot of ways to stop talking about them like they aren't servable because those talk triggers really do impact the way people wanna build and innovate in a segment. Um, but, you know, that's like, you know, we make car loans for $20,000 and people are able, companies are able to make those loans and make money on them. So why we wouldn't be able to make a margin on a small business loan is, is just totally silly and false. Um, it doesn't make do you sense. Think, do you think some of it goes back to, you know, the, you mentioned Y Combinator, the, the bias of East coast, West coast, and that a lot of the founders, I mean, you, you said at the beginning, a lot of the founders go to, you know, um, these fancy schools or, or very prestigious schools. And, you know, you're from Montana. Other founders, if they were from the middle of the country or a small town, would probably have a better sense of, all right, this is exactly what a small business is. And that it kind of, you know, recycle continues and it continues. And then obviously the media feeds into it because the media wants a splashy story versus you yep. know, kind of the more of the in-depth story. And so that, that narrative plays itself out over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and that, that's, I think you're totally right. Like all I've ever known is small business. Montana is built on small business. Like we don't even have any big corporate jobs here, you know, like, yeah. um, we're a community of small business owners that are very, they contribute a lot locally. They're very philanthropic. They employ most of the city I live in. Um, and, and they're running profitable businesses too. Like they're, they're not making money. And, and one of the misconceptions I think we have specifically in the venture backed world is I always hear like, Oh, what, how many small businesses fail? What is the failure rate? Because in venture, that's how we talk, right? A startup makes it or it doesn't make it. Yeah. And so we get hung up on failure rates. But if you look at small business in America, um, they might wind down, they might pause and come back to their LLC. But it's, it's not this like failure rate, like people talk about, like uh, a typical small business owner might have one or two employees, like a lot don't have very many at all. Maybe they're a management consulting and the owner of that just got offered their dream job. And so they wind their consulting business down over three months off for their clients, go and take that job for a few years, but they might kind of keep the, the business warm too, by having one side client and then jumping back in. So you just have to measure it with a different stick than the startup world. And so when you're in this venture backed world, serving this segment, there's a lot of education that has to happen between like me and even like the venture community, because you have to separate out like, yeah, this is how we're being funded and solving it. But the customer we serve is very, very different. And that's not how the cycle looks for them. What are, you know, the, the small businesses that you serve, what are some of the main impediments that they face when it comes to capital? Is it just that, do they actually go to the bank? They ask the bank for a loan, they're denied the loan. Are they aware of, I mean, you mentioned you came across FinTech uh, recently and weren't aware of it. Are they aware of some technology FinTechs that are beginning to serve the space. And then I know you guys have the grant uh, program, how aware yeah. of they of grants. And, and so what sure. are some of the, the funding issues and, and impediments that these companies face? Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's so many, um, 
And, and it's actually really interesting because like, for example, we do constant customer service surveys. And so we're always learning from our user base. And one of the questions we asked was, um, do you have a source of funding? And there were like five different answers, um, anywhere from no, and I don't know how to get funding. No, I've been declined. Yes. I use a personal credit card. Yes. I have an SBA loan, you know, like all these options. 70% replied, no, and I don't know how to get funding, which might sound surprising to those of us in the finance world, right? Because it's like our world, but you have to remember like just women owned businesses, there's 1800 new businesses formed every day. Yep. And these, you know, they're brand new to it. And they're usually excited about whatever their product or offering is. And so this idea that like, we're just like born knowing financial solutions is kind of crazy, but then once they are aware, so I think there is a, a problem with awareness. I think there's a big problem with the assumption that they can't get funding. So just like this idea that I must not be lendable, I'm a brand new business or I'm too small or, you know, so the things that they tell themselves without actually knowing the answer but then I would say like once they do go to get funding or they want to be lendable and they're seeking out their solutions, um, personal guarantees and collateral by far the two biggest issues. Yep. Um, and that's really the result of an outdated system, right? The way in which um, typical banks underwrite, how their credit boxes work. Banks are very conservative um, and for good reason, right? They, the, the multiples they have are actually very small. Um, and so if you think about the makeup of the United States, the makeup of the super small business owner, we're talking about a lot of people that don't have a home to leverage, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have the collateral and they don't have like the credit history to do the personal guarantee for that too. And so even if you think about like the SBA loans out there, which are awesome, like, you know, I've I uh, actually haven't had an SBA loan. I think we've had an SBA loan, but it also, an SBA loan requires its borrow, borrow, borrowers, let me talk, um, to put up collateral, usually their home, almost always their home. Um, so think about like the, the amount of people out there that don't have a home to leverage that can't get one of those loans. So for sure, by far the biggest issue. Um, when it comes to grants, uh, that was, I, I told you at the beginning that I wanted to de-risk the way in which I could attract um, this audience and also serve them. So I found that um, some businesses, most business owners don't know of grants and they don't really know how they work at the beginning but they really resort to them and start searching for them out of a frustration of not being able to get capital otherwise. So they go out searching for capital and trying to get a lending product. And then when they get declined or, or like read the qualifications and are like, I can't get this, they kind of go through this emotional journey where they like open their laptops and type in business grants as a solution but a lot of times they don't even want a business grant. They just want capital. They think they can't get any other capital. Yeah. And the reality is, is the grants out there, um, while we make them really easy to find and search for on our platform, they're limited. Like we work really hard to find all the grants out there. And I think we have a total of 280 posted right now. But 280 doesn't fund 26 million businesses. There's nothing. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're out there. We try to make them really easy to search and find and to get information on. Um, oftentimes it's part of just the natural journey of looking for funded that businesses learn about grants. What are, I mean, you know, you mentioned your background in marketing and, and obviously you, you have had some success reaching these businesses, but what are some other ways that that these companies can get better aware of the various funding sources? Because I, you know, what I usually do is I'll, I'll ask my wife, who's not in finance, like, "Have you heard of this or have you heard of that?" And most of the time, her answer is no when it comes to fintech, which gives me a sense for all right, fintech's not nearly as big as I think it is, even though I live it every day. 
Uh, and so that gives me a sense of, you know, there's probably most people walking around that don't know what fintech is. And so, you know, it's still a pretty big leap to assume that businesses will just find it naturally. And so right. are there ways that that fintech can do a better job at, at putting themselves in front of it? Because obviously banks have been ignoring these companies for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, well, yes. Um, and I think we're doing a really good job of that. <laughs> um, we're really good at, at being found by these businesses, but the truth is, is there could be like 20 companies just like funded, making it easier to find it. And, and we could all be successful because there's a lot of need out there. Um, you know, this, it's an interesting question though. And it's tricky because how I think about it is I think I've cracked the nut on how to find existing business owners in search of funding. But just like the problems in the venture world, let's say it needs to be like at every stage that we yeah. do better. Like we need to figure it out more earlier. We need better, more solutions. Like funded isn't the only thing that needs to exist in the market. We need um, we need better solutions for even earlier than what funded helps with. Um, we need we need financial services in the education system. <laughs> probably, yeah. And, and it never has been. Um, and I always found that to be an odd thing because once you leave college and you say you you go your journey, which was I need to you know I'm going to start a business, um, and you said 1,800 people. Um, or 1,800 women start businesses every single day. I think there's something like a half a million businesses started every year. I mean, that's a lot of people who probably have no idea right. what potential options are out there. Yeah, especially like so many people um, do start businesses with this, like, I don't need any capital. I'm going to like do it on my own, especially in the professional services segment. So, which is a really big part of the segment we serve and professional services is probably one of the easiest business models to start without capital. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause you're usually selling your time in exchange for a service. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's so hard because we want to get the word out. We want everyone to know, but it, you know, in the way our world works today, we first need like kind of a base of knowledge. We need a base of great information. And we live in a world where there's so much horrible content out there that it's like, you don't even know if you should trust what you are reading or, or you like go to your like grandpa that started a business and the way he got funded is like so different than the options out there today. And and I don't think as a financial system, we're good about educating people when we say no or decline them. Like, especially if you think it like so many business owners start at a local bank or now potentially a, a fintech neo bank to yep. set up a bank account. And the banks are never like, no, you can't get financing, but here's an entire website dedicated to all the ways you can get funding. They're like, you know, they decline the application and move on. Um, but it, it would, it takes, there's it. a, <laughs> there's a handful of banks that do that, but it's not, um, you know, it's not the norm for sure. Um, what's the, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned about funded, uh, since you've launched? Oh, so many, so many lessons. Um, but I would say the biggest one is to trust my gut. Um, you know, there's this, almost like intimidating factor to being in, in the venture backed world where it makes me wonder like these last 12 to 15 years as a business owner, like, is it a different game I'm playing? Um, do, do I not know as much as I think I do? And it turns out that I would actually argue small business owners know way more about what they're doing in building businesses than venture backed founders. Especially, especially a lot <laughs> of the, the venture, um, you know, the venture backed companies these days who've never lived through a difficult period, like we're just right. coming up on a potential recession right now. I mean, they've had it really, really good yeah. for the last 14, 15 years. And, you know, there's a lot of arrogance, I would say, in the market right now. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe just a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but I've really learned, I think I now see where I should have trusted my gut more. An example I have of that is, you know, we're, we're launching a card product, our business building card here in the next 30 days. And, um, there was a lot of pressure put on me to not go direct to market and use a bass player. Um, like, I don't know. I, I felt like I really got a lot of advice that like, maybe I didn't know enough to go direct or because I didn't come from tech or, um, I'm not a developer, um, that like, I need to go through a bass player, right. In order to launch our product. But I was surrounded by all these really smart people. I was constantly learning from, and, and I did, I, so I, I started out partnered with Crossover Bank and Term Sheet and I actually jumped ship and went to a bass player and second guessed myself, even though I didn't feel like it was the right thing. I ended up, we are going direct. And, and that was a really good lesson because the entire time I felt like in my gut, I knew using a bass player wasn't the right solution for us specifically because we're really trying to innovate um, in the way we're doing our underwriting and our credit box. Um, and um, in a bass player, when you're doing a credit product, isn't very flexible. So um, that was a hard lesson because I, I probably wasted three months um, of my time of my investors money um, when I went down that other rabbit hole. What would, um, what piece of advice did you receive um, since building your company from an investor, from a colleague? What was the best piece of advice that you've received thus far? Yeah. So um, I can't remember where I got this, but it is a big theme in my life and, and a big part of why I did funded when I was thinking about all the things I might do next. And it's that you only have so much time. So you might as well do the, the biggest, most impactful thing with your time. And that's certainly true of me. Like I'm an all in kind of person. Um, and, you know, so I think about my time and I'm going to work really hard all week, no matter what I'm doing. So I might as well do something that can have an enormous impact that could have an enormous return because either way, I'm going to work hard and we're all constrained by time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been like a very, very much a theme in my life and how I choose like what I'm going to do, where, you know, where I'm going to go, how I'm going to essentially spend my time is like, is like, go for it. You know, you could spend, you know, 60 hours a week building um, anything. You might as well build the biggest, best thing you can. Uh, tell us, tell the audience a little bit more about uh, the team around you and, and those that, that you work with every day. Yeah, I'm, my team you is so much cooler than I am because they are <laughs> more um, like fintech veterans, people in the financial markets that have been in it for a long time. And um, I've been so lucky because of the mission of Funded, the, our unique angle uh, it, it really has allowed me to attract these people that I really don't deserve to have on my team that are way, way, way too talented to be sent, spending their time with me. But because they really care about this segment, because they care about women-owned businesses, because they've maybe been women in fintech, not working with other women, they've wanted to come and work with Funded. So our team is nine right now plus a group of developers, about 10 people in Poland. So you could call it 19. Um, we're a remote first culture. So they're all over the country, San Francisco, North Carolina, Indianapolis now. Um, so kind of spread out. Um, we do have a handful of people in Montana, which I'm super proud of. I, I love Montana. Um, and we are, um, we are 90% women executive team, women team in general, um, have nothing against guys. Like I feel kind of bad for our, our head of product right now. Every time I say this, I'm like, we really <laughs> like guys though, we promise. It's just that this like mission has attracted that, which has been cool. Um, and I, I care deeply about a diverse team. So I would almost say I'm almost not proud that we're so heavily like female focused <laughs> gender wise on our team, but um, the key thread, though, is that everyone on, on our team is so incredibly talented, so incredibly qualified to solve this problem. 
Um, and I mostly just feel lucky to hang out and learn from them um, and then go out and tell our story to make sure that they get to keep doing what they're doing. How different is it this company versus some of your previous companies that were the small businesses that obviously you're you're funding now and that you're working with and and helping how different is that that dynamic and and the you know remote first versus i'm assuming most people were probably where you live and and you work there and it was probably a shop in town or, or something along those lines how different is that that dynamic Um, well, I've been in a lot of different businesses, including I've had a couple of remote companies too. Um, you know, surprisingly not that different. Um, but that's probably because I've been a leader CEO in all of these businesses. So I'm bringing my same style into funded. Now, if anything, I'm guessing the biggest difference is for the people on our team that have worked for other venture backed startups to now work for me. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of rare to have a first time venture backed person. That's not uh, first time entrepreneur. So I have a, you know, I have a lot of experience. I've managed people a long time. I've dealt with a lot of problems over the year um, that for them, I, I get a lot of feedback on just kind of like handling stress better, handling big decisions better, but it's because I've done it a long time. Um, I think where the differences come in um I don't even know, honestly, like, I actually (laughs) feel like I'm running this, like, you know, in a lot of ways with the same leadership and structure as a a well-run small business and small businesses have to be like really dialed to work, right? Like, um, there's very little room for error. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess there's uh... more on the line. Other people's (laughs) money is on the line in a way that hasn't been in the past, but, um, well, that leads me into the next question, which is, um, you know, how was the the fundraising process uh, as someone who was not previously venture backed and, and you're now venture backed? Um, and also, obviously, as a, a woman founder and CEO, how was raising capital and you know what kind of uh, impediments uh, did you run into and, um, you know, types of investors who maybe ask questions that are you know, obviously sexist and, uh, you shouldn't be asking. That doesn't happen. (laughs) I know for sure it does. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I just closed an additional, um, round of funding. Uh, so I'm like, congratulations. Thank you. And if you, you know, on paper, I shouldn't be here talking to you, right? Like I know the numbers. It's like, I am a female founder that is not technical, that is a, does not have a co-founder in Montana of all places in fintech, which is an industry I did did not come from. Um, So, you know, statistically I shouldn't be here. So I guess I'd better like go for it because I am. Um, With that though, um, fundraising actually went really well for me. And the only thing I can point to on why I had such a good experience is I assumed it was going to be like really effing hard. And so I prepared for it as if I was like preparing for the LSATs or something. It's like (laughs) I had a strategy, I had a system, I had a way that I was going to pound down the door of every human I knew that knew a venture capitalist. (laughs) Like um, I was willing to be annoying. Like I was going to do whatever it took to do this. And I kind of went into it as if I was like preparing for like an athletic event or something. And then I stuck with it as if not raising was, was not an option for me. Um, So I would say it was actually like more mindset than anything. Um, And then I just worked really hard at it every day. Although I will call out, um, being a female founder was not a big issue. Um, And I don't know if that's because I have a lot of years of experience as a business owner 
if um, I'm, I'm uniquely qualified to be the person in the world solving this problem or what. And, and of course, I have no idea, like the, the VCs that didn't want to fund me, why they didn't want to fund me. But I would say, honestly, like I had a great experience from the angle of being a female, but I too um, want a level playing field, which I think is true of all female founders. I don't look for concessions. I don't look to be treated differently. And, and I was competitive and wanted to be everyone else. And I, and that sounds actually wrong as I'm saying it, because the truth is that, you know, 2% of women get funded and I don't think I'm special. I think I'm lucky. And I think that number is total crap. Like it shouldn't exist. There's a massive problem in venture. Mm -hmm. I feel lucky that I got through those numbers. Um, but I hope, and now I, I work really hard to help my friends now. Um, and I think that the world's changing. And I think that we have a lot of positive news on the horizon. I actually think that this like weird market and down economy could um, really change those numbers a lot because all the women I know are really fantastic operators and really good at running their business. I mean, if you, were, if you look at the numbers, women owned businesses or women founders tend to outperform their male counterparts. And yeah. so if everyone's going back towards profitability and numbers and not these outsized um, valuations, then it, it begs to say women founders should easily get more capital than 2% because they clearly can operate companies better. Yeah, they should in theory. And that's how I feel too. But, um, and that's how I felt during COVID when COVID hit also, but there was a, it were obviously really interesting data came, came out that women um, investing in women went down during COVID. And so I think part of the problem is these like, you know, VCs that have been around too long um, that maybe should consider leaving um, went back to where their safe spot is when a scary time hit and they started relying more on their network again. Um, and so I, I'm fearful that that might be happening right now to women out there that totally deserve funding. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately all of us women are going to run the world and we're going to have our day and make sure everybody remembers it. I do think you sell yourself <laughs> short when you say it's, it's more luck than in talking to you. I've, clearly you're, you're exceptionally hard worker and um, you're extremely prepared. So I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it all on luck there. Um, in, in terms of, you know, either through the fundraising process or if another founder picked up the episode, another female founder, male founder, whoever, what would be something that you'd say, Hey, you know, this is a lesson that you should take from my journey that could help you on your journey. Yeah. I think um, playing your own game is something I really like to share and want a message I would like to sp spread out there. There's so much pressure in this world to be like, Oh my gosh, Jeff Bezos makes up that 415. Then he does, you know, like, and, and so I must be broken because I don't do that. Um, I'm such a big believer that everybody has their kind of own natural rhythm and flow and way of doing things. And the best thing you can do is stick to who you are and play your game and your business um, and not get hung up on like the outsiders. Like, you know, in the, like an example of that that's on my mind right now is like you hear, like you just close the seed round and then you hear about so-and-so close the seed round, but their post money valuation was this. And then you're like, oh my God, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> and um, I just think like, play your own game, do your thing. Um, but with fundraising, I really do believe in treating it like a competitive sport that you must win. <laughs> um, so that would be my direct advice. We have just a, a few minutes left, so I like to end uh, a little bit lighter with some fun questions. Uh, do you have a favorite book and the last book that you read? Oh gosh, I don't. I don't like read books. I read email. Um, <laughs> like I'm very good at reading email. Um, I, I read a lot of them, um, but books. You know, I I did. This is almost embarrassing because the movie just came out. Um, probably the last book I read was um, Where the Crawdads Sing. Um, I actually don't like business books. Um, I've been around 
really successful business owners for a long time. And I don't know, I just, I don't buy business books or read them. I tend to read things that help me check out of life and um, kind of relax and, and reprioritize, I suppose. Well, speaking of checking out, what is uh, your checkout activity? What do you do to unwind, especially in Montana? Is it enjoy yeah. nature? I'm assuming that's near the top of the list. Definitely. Um, I am for sure a trail runner and hiker. I love to spend time deep in the mountains alone. Um, there's just something very like freeing about that when you get, when you're completely alone and you're seven miles in from a trailhead and um I don't know. It's, it's really relaxing. My thoughts get really clear when I'm out in the mountains. So uh, yeah, I like to be in the mountains. Uh, do you watch sports, uh, have a favorite team, have a favorite sport? I have lots of sports. I don't like that usually revolve <laughs> around what my husband has on the TV, like golf. <laughs> um, so no, um, you know, I originally was born in Salt Lake, so I am like a true Utah jazz fan. Um, I just think they're cool. I grew up in the Carl Malone, John Stockton days, and it stuck with me in our house. Um, we are very loyal Georgia Bulldog college football fans. My yeah. husband went to Georgia. And so I don't even like, I don't even like get the SEC and all that stuff, but I go to the games and I put smile on and <laughs> I try not to make fun of them when I'm at an Alabama game um, and be a good, uh, true cheerleader, yeah. but not really. Well, I'm a Notre Dame fan, so it's the SEC is a, oh. a sore spot here. <laughs> yes, I, I went to the Notre Dame Georgia game. It was awesome because I mean Georgia won, but yeah, um, Notre it was Dame, a good game. Though. Very cool too. <laughs> <laughs> um do you have a favorite vacation spot yes pretty much anywhere we go in our van on the weekends we have a camper van um usually parked next to a montana mountain lake on the weekends <laughs> um and it is so much better than anywhere i've ever traveled in the world so love road trips and then final question uh biggest inspiration in life yeah you know this one is interesting when I really pause to think about it. The time I get like chills when I hear something is those moments where someone tells you their story of betting on themselves, you know, like when they first started a business, but they had a really good job and they did it anyways. Like I'm pretty inspired by those moments that entrepreneurs like take a leap Um and though that that type of person in general is like my most inspiring person, I I hope to be just like. Well, Stephanie, I greatly appreciate you giving me a few minutes and coming on the show. If someone um, wants to get in touch with you, get in touch, um, you know, with the team, and and um, you know, potentially get get funding or or chat with you, uh, how do they do that? Yep. Um, visit our website, getfunded.com, um, funded spell F-U-N-D-I-D. Um, we're on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. That's the best spot to find me because like me not being from the tech world, I am not on Twitter and don't plan to be. Um, <laughs> I hear it's a very cool spot, but um, I am still on LinkedIn. It's not that cool. Um, <laughs> well, thank you uh, again for uh, a few minutes. Continued success to you and the team, and hopefully we'll get you back sometime in the future.